Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the uh, Alan Turing Institute uh, Multi Agent Systems Talk Series. Uh, my name is Stefano Albrecht. I'm one of the organizers uh, of this uh, meeting series together with uh, Michael Woodr Woodridge from Oxford University. Uh, the talks are uploaded online to our uh, YouTube channel. You can find the link on the uh, special interest group on the Turing pages. And uh, I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker. Today we have Professor Edith Elkin, Elkind, who is a professor of computer science at Oxford University. She obtained her PhD from Princeton in uh, 2005 and has worked in the UK, Israel and Singapore before joining Oxford in 2013. She works in algorithmic game theory with a focus on algorithms for collective decision making and coalition formation. Edith has published over 100 papers in leading AI conferences and journals and has served as a program chair of several conferences, including WINE, AMAS, ACMAC, and she will serve as a program chair of each guy in 2023. That's good to know. So thank you very much, uh, Edith, for taking the time to uh, give the presentation and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks for the kind introduction. So this is a paper that combines voting and collision information. It's algorithmic game theory more than artificial intelligence, but here we try to think about how agents could form collisions and these agents could be human or artificial. Okay, so the basic setup. Yeah, so the basic setup we are going to be working with is the setup of spatial collision formation, which is something that is very well studied and understood in political science and game theory. So I first describe the traditional setup and then I'll explain how what we do differs from that traditional setup. So in the traditional setup, the agents who are thought of as political parties either have or have to adopt positions in a multidimensional proposal space. So the traditional political space is usually thought of as two-dimensional. So there's the economic liberal conservative axis and there's a social liberal conservative axis, right? So your position on taxes versus your positions on say abortions and gay marriage. Right, so parties sometimes I assume to, you know, inherently have this position, right, and sometimes they're flexible and they can select positions for themselves, how they want to sell them to the voters, right, and then these parties with their positions aim to form a winning coalition to govern, right, and the winning coalition means um, a position that they should collectively adopt, right, and for coalition to be winning, it has to contain the majority of voting they Kind of the majority of the parties. Right? And there's a very significant literature on this model, right? So it goes back almost 100 years ago. There are some recent surveys, right? And the literature that typically studies it is non computational, sometimes theoretical, sometimes data driven, but it's typically political science literature. So what we do in this paper, we tweak this model a little bit by assuming that we have a status quo and agents who are seeking to implement a change from the status quo. So like in the classic model, uh, we consider proposal space, which is a metric space. So for instance, it can be a finite or infinite subset of RD. Like in the classic literature, each agent has an ideal point, which is her opinion on all the relevant issues. But there's also the special point, the status quo, which indicates what position is adopted by the society right now. So what is the current state of affairs? Right, and now agents can, based on that, can decide how they feel about all purposes. So there's an agent B who sits in the position B, right? So there's a status quo R. So how should an agent decide how they feel about an alternative proposal? Well, it's natural to say that I, as an agent, prefer pr approve a proposal if, I, if it's more similar to my true position than the current status quo if changing to this proposal would be beneficial to me, right? And mathematically, we can write it as distance from me to the proposal is less than the distance from me to the set. So how can we encode it geometrically? Well, very simply, if you have an agent whose preferred point is V1 and the status quo is R, let's draw a circle with the radius V1 R, right? And everything in that circle is preferable to me, agent one, than the status quo. Right, so if we, if we look at this proposal A, agent one prefers it to the status quo, agent two doesn't. So another useful geometric way to think of think, of thinking about the proposals is to take a proposal A, different from the status quo, and ask which agents would prefer that proposal to the status quo. 
So look at it from the perspective of proposals or other natures. Right? And then again, the answer has an easy geometric interpretation. So we draw a line connecting A and R, we draw a perpendicular to the center of this line. Everything on the R side of this line would be voters who prefer the status quo to the new proposal A. And everything on the other side of the line would be voters who prefer A to the status quo R. Right? And let's say that a proposal is popular. If the number of voters who approve this proposal is at least the number of voters who approve any other proposal, right? And we are in the business then of finding the most supported proposal. So what we want to happen is the agents forming a coalition around a popular proposal, right? Which will enable them to affect change from the status quo if this popular proposal is actually supported by more than half of the agents. Okay, so I didn't say much about my authors on paper, let me uh, rectify that now. So my co-authors are uh, David Grossi from Groningen, importantly, Udi Shapiro and Nimrod Pelman, two collaborators from Israel, right? And that was the first paper on this topic. And then there was a follow-up paper with my student, Abig Bosch and Paul Goldberg, who is a big other advisor. So the original motivation for this book, uh, while well, you may remember political situation in Israel, in case some of you are following international politics some three years ago, when Benjamin Netanyahu was a president of Israel for a very, prime minister of Israel for a very long time, was up for re-election, right? And a lot of political sentiment in Israel was concentrated around selecting anyone other than Netanyahu, right? Affecting a change from the status quo. Not so, and these other parties and kind of other voters wouldn't necessarily agree on a political direction that would be better than what Netanyahu represented. They just didn't want Netanyahu to be elected, and effectively they wanted to affect any change that would be a change from the status quo. Right? And the question that was very important in Israeli politics at that point, and was answered in affirmative since then, is there a majority coalition that would favor a proposal that is different from the status quo? So what we try to do in this book is to identify mechanisms for selecting such proposals, proposals that allow agents to move on from the status quo. Okay, so let's do an example. And you can see that these are not very new slides. They build on kind of pandemic time thinking, right? So let's look at an example where our two axes are two approaches to fighting the COVID pandemic, right? So one has to do with, okay, so vaccinations are not here because they don't really make a very good access in this context, right? So the two axes I want to think about is what is open, and what is closed. Like think really early pandemic days, right? When basically we had two ways of fighting the pandemic by keeping by keeping many establishments closed or asking people to wear masks. Right, and these two access what is open and what is closed and where people are required to masks are somewhat independent. Right, so my horizontal axis will be masks, right? Going from no masks anywhere to having to wear masks everywhere. So I think the most extreme point is having to wear a mask on the beach. Right, and the second axis, the vertical axis, would be what is open. Right, and at the bare minimum, we had to keep essential shops open, even though Shanghai experience now shows that, you know, one can be even more locked down than that. Right, and the most open, I think we agree that keeping the open, no nightclubs open, really means that nothing really is closed. Right, and there are a lot of intermediate positions on both axes where you require people to masks. Masks in shops, masks in schools, right? And you can think of it as a left to right axis, right? So masks in shops or public transportations is a really mild requirement. Requiring people to masks outdoors is pretty extreme, right? And there are things in between, right? And with respect to what is open, again, there is a reasonable priority order on different establishments that can be open. Right, and now you can have different voters who have different uh, ideal points in this two-dimensional space. Right, so for instance, voter one really hates masks. So voter one is a proponent of no masks at all, but voter one is relatively happy with keeping a lot of places closed. So cafe should be open just for takeaway, nothing else should be open, right? But at least there is no mask. Right, and we've got the, the opposite. We've got the voter four who says that, yeah, people should mask universally, but on the other hand, given masking, everything should be open. Right, and we see a variety of positions like that. So suppose, um, Suppose I draw a line like that, separating vote. So this line would separate voter two, voter three, and voter four from voter one and voter five, right? And this line would, would correspond to moving from the current default, which is, you know, 
having some places open and some closed and having some masking policy, moving it towards having more open society, right? And moving it in this way would be preferred to the agents who are above that line. So V2, V3, and V4 would prefer that move, and V1 and V5 would disapprove that move. Right, so for instance, you can see that opening cafes for eating in would be a majority approved move in this case. Right, so we can have, so there's a proposal that has majority support, right, which is to keep the current masking policy, but opening cafes for eating. In. Right? So in the opposite direction, we can shift the masking policy to be a little bit more strict, right, and I've got three voters who would approve that. Right, so this is, but this is still not the maximum amount of support you can get. Right, so you can, in fact, by shifting your policy a little bit more towards masking and a little bit more towards opening, get a proposal that would sit roughly somewhere here, and that would be approved by four voters relative to the status quo, right, and that would be a popular proposal. Right, and that's not a unique optimal proposal, so for one thing, there would be some other proposals in the same environment, in the same sort of region on the map, but also you can draw your line in a different way and still have four people on the same side of the line, kind of opposite the status quo. Right, so this is kind of the type of scenarios we're interested in dealing with. Right, so what we want to do is we want to identify popular proposals. Right now, this isn't a very difficult challenge if you're prepared to do it in a centralized fashion, at least in some proposal spaces. But what we'd like to do is to adopt a multi-agent perspective on it and ask if agents themselves can arrive to popular proposals in a decentralized way. So what we're interested in is coalition formation dynamics that helps agents to write their good output. So when we, think about, when we think about coalitions in this context, we think of coalition not just as a set of agents, but the set of agents together with a proposal. Right? So we call it deliberative coalition, so it has two components, a coalition and a proposal. Right? And we require that all agents in the coalition approve this proposal, meaning they prefer it to the status quo. Right? And then the set of agents is split into deliberative coalitions, right? So each agent sits in some coalition and that coalition approves some proposal, right? So for instance, an agent can remain a single open agent, right? So stick to the proposal that they most approve of, right? And that would be a valid deliberative coalition, right? But those agents can form groups, right? And these groups may then adopt positions that will be different from individual agents' positions. So what happens during deliberation is we start with some coalition structure, a natural starting point would be where each agent sits in a singleton coalition and their position is the most, their proposal of the deliberative coalition is their actual position, right? And then this coalition structure evolves somehow. So we capture that by a notion of deliberation and deliberation is a sequence of deliberative coalition structures. And we want deliberation to converge and we want it to converge to a good outcome. Okay. So specifically, we say that the deliberation succeeds if first it terminates, it doesn't cycle indefinitely, right? And second, the coalition structure that we get at the termination actually discovers a popular proposal. So more specifically, it contains a coalition together with a proposal such that, okay, so the important thing is that the proposal is popular, has at least as much support as any other proposal. And second, it contains all agents who support it. So we want our decentralized coalition information process to discover this good alternative to the status quo. So I didn't say much about how deliberation presents. So let me elaborate a little bit on this now and we'll delve into more details a little bit later. So potential transition could be that we have a single agent that moves from one coalition to another, right? And for that to happen, of course, the agent would need to approve the proposal of the new coalition. Right, so another thing that could happen is that two coalitions can merge and adopt a new proposal, right? And we can potentially think of other types of moves, and in fact, we'll discuss some later. Uh, so what we will insist on when defining possible transitions are two properties, being myopic and being consensus driven. Right, so first we say that an agent can only be part of deliberative coalition if it approves the proposal of that deliberative coalition. So if an agent currently sits in deliberative coalition CP, then they can only move to C star P star if they approve P star, right? So you can never be in a coalition whose proposal you don't approve of, even temporarily. And second, our agents, remember they're in the business of discovering large coalition that can support a proposal different from the status quo. So if we assume that agents are myopic, 
then it's sort of natural to assume that they always try to move to a bigger collision. Right? So let me, let's say that they myopically try to maximize the size of the collision they're in, right? And then this condition becomes the current size of the collision they're moving to is at least the current size of their collision. Know that I have greater equal here, right? So this is not a mistake. It's greater equal because once my agent moves from CP to C star, B star, C star together with him will be bigger than the collision he's currently in, right? If this condition holds, right? So the agents move so that after they move, they are in a larger collision compared to what they started. So something that is worth noting here is that, okay, agents are not particularly picky about the proposal. Right, so it's really kind of anyone but him, anyone other than the status quo kind of situation. Right, so I'm not saying an agent can move from CP to C star, P star, if P star is closer to them than P is, right? So they don't really reason about which approval they like, which proposal they like. Right, so think of them as desperate to overthrow the status quo. So they're willing to get behind any proposal that they approve, right, as long as it leads to affirmation of the bigger touch. Right, and this formation of a bigger collision property, right, so they optimize it myopically. Right, so this is the basic setup. So it differs in several ways from what is traditionally studied in political science literature, and those we study it using slightly different techniques and ask different questions. Right, but fundamentally, our research question is as follows. So which type of transitions they guarantee that the agents can form a collision around a popular proposal? Right. And of course, you can't answer this question in full generality. The answer may depend on the metric space. Right? So if the metric space is particularly simple, then maybe simple transition rules will suffice for the agents to discover kind of a good proposal. Right? And if the metric space is more complex, right, then we may need to, to allow agents more flexibility in how they are they're allowed to move if they, want, if they want them to succeed. Right, and as a computer scientist, the question I want to ask here, and that political scientists don't typically ask, can we, what type of transitions and what type of metric spaces guarantee convergence, not just in some infinite limit, but after polynomial in many transitions? Okay, so let's try to make this research agenda a little bit more concrete. So let me define several types of transitions that we're going to consider in this way. So the most basic transition, familiar to those of you who have looked at collisional games and in particular hedonic games, would be single agent transitions. Right? So in these transitions, an agent sitting in collision C, approving proposal P, moves to a collision C prime, sorry, agent sitting in C prime, uh, agent A sitting in C prime moves to collision C. Right? So for this transition to be valid, it needs to be the case that C is at least as large as C prime, so that A eventually ends up in a bigger collision, right? And it also has to be the case that A approves B so that A doesn't end up in a collision that she doesn't like. Okay, more general form of transition, which involves not just one agent, but potentially groups of agents, is two collisions merging with the proposal being adopted, being the proposal of one of the two original collisions, right? So you can think of this move as agent in collision C prime, P prime deciding that as a coalition altogether, they're going to join the coalition CP, right? And accept the proposal of that coalition, right? And of course, this move will certainly lead to a bigger coalition, but it's only permissible if all members of C prime actually approve this new proposal. A slightly more general form of transition is a merge transition, which is kind of like follow transition in that members of the two coalitions combine forces, Right, but the difference now is that they are allowed to adopt a new proposal P star, which may be different from both P and P prime. Right, so think of it as two coalitions getting together, saying, you know what, both of us can agree on something that is different from the status quo. There is something that appeals to all of us and differs from the status quo, but it's none of our current proposals, so, we, so it has to be some new goal. Right, and of course, this is permissible exactly if all agents approve this new goal. And the last one is the most interesting and I think realistic type of transitions, which also will give us the most trouble computationally. Right? And this is what we call compromise transitions. In compromise transitions, we start again with two coalitions, C approving P and C prime approving P prime. And what these agents do is as follows. So they identify a new proposal P star and 
then what happens is that some agents in C approve B star, some of the agents in C prime approve B star, but maybe not all of them do. So what happens then is that all agents from both coalitions who approve B star form a coalition around B star, and this is the red coalition here, but agents who don't approve B star are left behind. Right, so in the first coalition, we have agents who don't approve B star and therefore didn't vote, right? And then they stay in that coalition with the proposal B. Same for the second coalition, C prime, right? And we've got this new coalition, right? And note that this move may potentially increase the number of coalitions, right? And based on the intuition that we want to capture, this move is only valid if the agents who move approve B star, right? And if this results in them forming a bigger coalition than the original coalition, right? So note that this move kind of makes the agents who are left behind more miserable, right? So they are now in a smaller coalition because some of their friends abandoned him, right? And we don't care if they approve of that move or not, right? So what we care about is that people who actually move and adopt a new proposal are happy to be in that new coalition, right? So this is what we call compromise transition, compromise between two coalitions. Okay, so to illustrate this a little bit, so let's look at this metric space with all of the status quo being the center of a circle and agents and other proposals sitting on the circle. Right, and here, let's say we have three deliberative coalitions. We have coalition consisting of agents one, two, and three and adopting A as its proposal. And you can see that if you use the, the standard R2 metric, all of V1, V2, V3 are closer to A than they are to R. Right, so they all prefer A to R. Right, and then we have another coalition around B, which contains agents four, five, and six. And we have a singleton coalition around C, which consists of both or seven. Okay, so thinking of the type of transitions we have introduced. So what kind of transitions are we going to see here? Well, first I claim that there are no single agent transitions. Why? Well, who would move where? Right, if you look at agent B7, Right, so this agent could potentially move to this coalition or to this coalition, but she actually prefers the status quo to their proposals. Right, so their proposals are further from her than ours. Right, so this agent doesn't want to move. Similarly, agents from here, agents from here don't want to move to C. Right, then there can't even be any move between these two coalitions. Right, coalition C one and coalition C two. So one move that can happen potentially C1 can change its position, its collective position from A to A star, because A star is still approved by all members of this collection. Right? And this is the kind of move that we don't consider in our work because it doesn't make sense myopically, but may be of interest in principle in non-myopic models, because that may help to attract new agents to the collection in the future. Right? So think of it. So suppose you have a party that support some fairly radical position that all of you like better than the status quo, but you find really hard to recruit new members. So what you may want to do is to adopt a less radical position that will allow you to bring in additional membership, right? And this will be fine as long as you're all still approving the new position of finding it better than the status quo. Okay, other types of transitions, but okay, merge transitions, no, none of these positions can merge around the, along the sing, around the single proposal. But what we do have is a, a compromise transition, which would, uh, which would result in V2, V3, V4, V5, forming a coalition around B. For them to do that, they would have to leave their friends behind. So V1 wouldn't join a coalition around B. V6 wouldn't join a coalition around B. But this is nevertheless a valid compromise transition because it would result in the formation of a larger group. Right? And, and as you can see, B is actually a popular proposal. It's actually supported by four agents. And I don't think you can have more than four in this example. Okay, so now let's, let's talk a little bit about our research agenda. In which, which transitions ensure convergence in which metric space? Okay, so the first, the most basic metric space to consider would be one dimensional line. Right? And in one dimensional line, even though it's very simple, even the single agent transitions may fail to succeed. So I think this example is kind of instructive of what we actually observe kind of in societies. So we have status quo or, so we have a group of people uh, supporting a proposal which is left to the status quo. And we have two groups of people supporting two different proposals which are nevertheless right of the status quo. So can one agent here move to another college? Well, I claim they can't 
Right, okay, so these agents certainly are not going to move to cross R, right? And here it seems not unreasonable for someone to move from the collision supporting C to the collision supporting B, but this isn't going to happen because they're currently in collision of size three, and after they move, the new collision would also have three agents, right? So it's not an improving move, it's not worthwhile. Okay, and this means that our deliberation in this case, sorry, fails to succeed because in fact, all these five agents on the right converging around B would be a good outcome because all five of them prefer B to the status quo. B is to the right of the status quo, right? And all of them like it, right? But if you just, if you're just limited to single agent deviation, this isn't going to happen. On the other hand, as can be seen in this example and then proved more generally, if we allow agents to perform follow transitions, remember this is when two collisions merge and adopt the proposal of one of these collisions, right? then this, in this universe uh, in, and in one dimension, we get convergence, right? So in this example, so follow transitions would mean the three agents supporting C moving here forming a collision with two guys who support B so that the new collision would contain five members who support B. Which I claim that this type of transitions would always be possible. So follow transitions will always identify a majority supported outcome. Right, and briefly, the reason for that is as follows. So there can't be a no deliberative collision that spans zero, that contains both as uh, left, to, left of R and right of R, right? Because it, there can't be a proposal that all of them prefer to R. Right, so any proposal left of R, so agents to the right of R like it less than R, any proposal right of R, agents left of R like it less than R. Right, so no deliberative collision can span zero. Right, so we have some collisions sitting to the left of R, some collisions sitting to the right of R. Now, if you have two positive collisions, right, then we can look at the less radical of them, and the more radical collision can follow the less radical collision like in our example, right? And indeed on the line, this will always be feasible because people who are supporting a more radical right-wing proposal will also be happy with the less radical right-wing proposal, right? And similarly for two negative collisions. So this means that kind of whenever you have two collisions on the same side of R, they should be able to merge together using follow transition. So if no transitions are available, we have at most two collisions with one of them being positive, one of them being negative, right? And one of these has to be a, has to be a collision on the popular proposal. So because kind of whatever, pro whatever proposal is supported by the larger of these two collisions, it can't attract any more people because these other people actually sit at the other side of the status quo. Okay, so this is R1. In R1, so it's kind of good news. We identified a very simple type of transitions, follow transitions, that already guarantee convergence. Unfortunately, this result doesn't really generate, generalize well beyond one dimensional life. Right? So if you look already in two dimensions, and much of the political spectrum is actually two dimensional, then both single agent and follow transitions may fail to succeed. So this is illustrated by this example. So here we have two agents supporting proposal A, two agents supporting proposal B, right? And in fact, all of them would be happy with the proposal P, but follow transitions don't allow them to join forces behind B, right? Because follow transitions mean that either A or B would have to be adopted as a new proposal. So in this particular case, okay, merge transitions, which exactly allow two coalitions to merge behind a new proposal, would actually be helpful. Right? And in fact, we can identify a class of metric spaces where merge transitions succeed. Right? And these are three shaped metric spaces. Right? So the argument here is fairly simple. So let's arbitrarily select the status quo as the root of our tree. So let's root our tree at that point. Right? And then if there's a popular proposal, we can argue that one of the root's children will be popular. Right? And therefore, all agents sitting in that. So basically, so we can focus on the subtrees kind of emanating from the root, right? So we can look at all agents sitting in a subtree and all these agents would actually prefer P to the status quo. So we can think of these agents, how the, so all these agents could potentially, whatever collision they start in, they should be able to form a collision around P. All the agents sitting here would be able to form a collision around P prime, but crucially agents in one subtree 
don't approve the proposals in the other sub three because to go from P to P prime, you have to cross R, right? So no agent here would find P prime more appealing than R. Right, so all the action happens in the subtrees, right? And therefore it's possible to identify a popular proposal. Okay, so this is a little bit hand wavy, but can't be formal. Okay, so we have a class of metric spaces where merge transitions succeed, right? But if we just go back to R2 and tweak our example a little bit, so we can see an example of a space where merge transitions are insufficient, right? So here again, we want the agents in the left collision and agents in the right collision to converge on P. Not all of them approve P, but there are four of them who do. And for them to arrive at P, what they really need to perform is a compromise transition. Right? This compromise transition would take two people from here, two people from here, and they will form a collision around P. Okay, so compromises, yes, yeah, so seem to be useful in this example. And in fact, we have a fairly general result here. So the theorem here is that if the proposal space is RD, then compromise transitions are guaranteed to succeed. Succeed to remind you first mean that they converge, and second mean that once they converge, a popular proposal is identified. Right, so this sounds like a fairly general and powerful result. Unfortunately, it's not powerful as we want it to be, because it means that proposal, for it to hold, the proposal space needs to be all of RD, which in terms of political science, or if you'd like our COVID example, means that agents should be able to identify, to formulate a policy for every potential point in the proposal space, right? So for instance, for our masking and closure example, it would be, it might be a long list of settings where, where we want people to mask, right? And an equally long setting for what exactly is allowed to remain open, right? So this description may have to be incredibly fine grained Right? So this is what it means to say that proposal space is RD. Right? So we can select points from RD as our proposals with any degree of precision. Right? So this is a caveat that this result isn't as powerful as we want it to be. But nevertheless, right, it tells us something useful. So let me give you an idea of how we are going to prove it. Okay. So basically the idea is as follows. So suppose you're running your uh, deliberation process with compromise transitions and um, okay. And you are in some configuration, right? So my claim will be that if this configuration doesn't contain a coalition supporting a popular proposal, then you can make progress. Okay, so now I'm going to argue that whenever kind of there isn't a coalition on popular proposal, then progress can be made. Right, so first case is that you only have two coalitions left, but none of them is a collision formed behind a popular proposal, right? So both of your collisions support kind of okayish proposal, but there is way to form an even bigger collision around another proposal, right? And that's an easy scenario because two collisions can always compromise, right? So compromise in that case means taking that proposal that is popular, that in fact would have the most support, right? And just asking all agents to support it to move towards it, right? And that will be a valid compromise move. Right, so if there are just two collisions left here, so now suppose that three collisions are left, then I claim that it can't be the case that there are three collisions left and we can't make any move, because if three collisions are left, then either someone can join the largest collision currently present, or two collisions can merge. Right, and now let me give a sketch of the proof of this claim. So suppose we have at least three collisions that have. So let me look at this at the biggest collision. So in, in this example, this would be this collision over there. And let A be the proposal supported by that collision. So let me connect A and R. So I'm going to do my proof in two dimensions, but it generalizes easier to an arbitrary number of dimensions. So let me connect A and R. Let me draw the perpendicular. So generally, it will be a se uh, separating hyperplane. Right, and sort of by construction, I know that all members of my collision, this collision around, around A, refer A to the status quo. So now I'm going to move this line slowly towards R, right? And now let me check, what I'm going to check now, if there are any agents who still sit on the same side of this line as A. Right, so in this case, the answer is yes, I've got these two guys. Right, so suppose it's like that. Suppose I've got some additional guys who are sitting on the relevant side of R. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to identify a point A prime, which is kind of going towards the same direction as A from R, but going not very far, moving very little, right? A very diluted version of, of A. Right, and if I do that, right, and then, then I can ensure that these agents on the same side of R as A, right? So maybe A is too radical for them, right? But because they're on the same side of my hyperplane, I can find a, an acceptable proposal for them, which is kind of like A but diluted, that they can agree to. Right, and this way I can grow my collection, right? So I can get someone to join the largest collection, right? And that will be at the expense of that collection, potentially changing its opinion to something less said. Okay, so suppose, okay, so one option is I have this additional agent and that works. So this will be my new collection. So the other option is as when I, when I move this slide, I only have my original collection on this side of the slide. But I assume that there are at least three collections left. So therefore, I must have at least two collisions sitting on this side of this line, right? And what this means is that I can identify a proposal that is kind of very close to R and but goes in the direction opposite of A, which will be appealing to all of these to all of these guys, right? And this will be a proposal that these two collisions can merge around, right? So either I get someone on this side and then they can move to the largest collision, or I have two uh, two collisions here and they can. Merge. Right? And by the way, that whoever was, whoever was on this side could always move to the largest collection because that would result in them being in a bigger collection, right? Because they're moving to the current largest collection, right? And I set things up so that they would approve the proposal. Okay. So compromises help if the proposal space is entire RT. As the theorem goes, in fact, if the proposal space is a dense subset of RD, but not if, an, if it is an arbitrary subset of RD. Right, so it doesn't quite work for sparse settings. Right, so this is a specific example that I'd rather skip for now. So what I should really be discussing with you as a computer scientist, not just the possibility of convergence, but the speed of convergence. Okay, so and the speed of convergence really kind of draws a line between compromised transitions and simple type transitions. So my first claim is that if we only perform single agent merge and follow transitions that don't involve of splitting up two existing collisions, then we will necessarily terminate in at most order of n squared steps where n is the number of each. Right, and this fourth follows by a very simple potential argument. Right, so given a collision structure, let's look at the potential function, which is the sum of squares of collision sizes. Right, and then it can be checked that with each move, this quantity increases. Right, so it's easy to see for merge and follow transitions, right? Because you are going from A squared plus B squared to A plus B squared, so that's an increase, right? And for single agents, because they move so as to form a larger collisions, it also, it also holds that this potential increases, right? And now this potential takes values between zero and N squared. It increases strictly with each iteration, so therefore we can have at most N squared iterations. With compromised transitions, though, the story is different. So we can construct a simple example where a compromise transition may fail to increase this potential function we just defined. We can define a more complex potential function and show that every sequence of compromise transitions terminates at that most n to the power n steps. So that will result from the, my original paper and then late a big improved it to two to the n. So we use some kind of lexicographic potential function. Right, and in fact, this is more or less as good as it gets because, and this is also an example by Abi. So there can be a very long sequence of compromised transitions. So one that takes it as many as two to the power square root and over two steps to converge. Right, so under compromised transitions, convergence may indeed take a long time. Okay, so perhaps something that is worth mentioning is that if we are in RD, right, and no matter where we start, then there's a sequence of compromised transitions that converges in at most order of n squared steps, right? And in fact, it's a very easy sequence that we can encourage agents to use, right? So basically, okay, if you revisit our proof of convergence in RD, we observe that if there are three collisions, there is a merge transition or a single agent transition, right? So this is just one step, right? And if there are more than three collisions, uh, if there are more than three collisions, so we can tell you, 
Okay, if that okay, first if there are two collisions, right, then there is just a single compromise step and pattern, right? And if there are three collisions, there is a merge of single agent transition, which increases our old potential function. So basically, we can tell agents development, right? If you're in a collision structure and it contains at least three collisions, look around. There should be a way either for a single agent to move or for a merge to happen, right? And we know that such transitions can happen in a sequence at most n squared times. Right, so after that, we will be out of, um, right, so we will necessarily arrive to a situation where there are at most two collisions, right, and then a single compromise step may be needed. Right, so we basically tell agents to perform simple moves, kind of, for as long as possible, and they can only run out of simple moves if there are only two collisions left, right, and then there's just one more additional step to each convergence. Okay, so this is telling us something about the speed of convergence, but it relies on agents' ability to identify complex moves, right? Because these compromised transitions can be quite complex. What should the agents agree on? Where should this new point be? Which agent should follow it, right? So this is not entirely trivial. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the complexity of identifying transitions. For single agent transitions, the problem is clearly polynomial time. We can go over all agent collision pairs and check if an agent is able to move to that collision. For follow transitions, it's also polynomial time. We look at pairs of collisions and ask if one pair can join the other and adopt the proposal of its new friends. Merge transitions, again, polynomial time, but slightly more complicated because the merging collision should be able to identify the new proposal. Right, so to find this proposal approved by all members of both collisions, right, so this is a question of where there is a hyperplane separating both S from R. Right, and in RD, this question can be answered efficient. But for compromise transitions, uh, the problem of deciding if there's a compromise transition is NP hot. Right? In fact, it's an NP hot to check if there exists a proposal with at least T approvals. Okay, so the metric spaces I've been talking about so far are mostly focused on RD with Euclidean distance. So let me say also a few words about a metric space that should be very familiar to logicians. Right, and this is the D hypercube where vertices, so this D dimension, so that D issues and on each issue you can take position zero. Right, so now you can think of proposals as taking zero one position on all possible issues, on all possible D issues. You can take on voters as having a position on all possible D issues. Right, so again, voters vote for proposals that they prefer to the status quo. It will be convenient to identify status quo with zero in this setting. Right, and then again, we can ask in this metric space, which is discrete, so our previous theorem doesn't apply, what can we achieve by compromise transition? And then even for D equal three, it's easy to see that compromises may be. Right, so here's an example of how compromises may be. So let's look at these three collisions. So I have a collision along this edge. Both of these guys prefer this point to the status quo zero. I have a collision here. Both of these guys prefer this point to zero and have this single. So what also, what I could also identify is a collision, collision of these yellow vertices, which is a collision of size three, bigger than any of those collisions. They could all agree on this point. They could all agree, let me see on what point, on, um, so all these three guys actually prefer this yellow point to the status quo to zero, right? So they find, so for instance, for this age, for this agent, the distance to here is one, the distance to zero is two, same for this agent, and this agent is also perfectly happy. Right? However, compromise transition, for compromise transition to happen, we can only take two coalitions, right? And any move involving two coalitions would not lead to an improvement in this scenario. So therefore, we may need to look beyond two compromises. So the original reason we looked beyond two compromises, the original reason we looked at two compromises is that we wanted to model negotiation as it happens in teams, right? And negotiation can feasibly happen if you have two teams, two parties considering a merge, right? But the more parties you have, the more difficult it is to improve, right? But here we seem to have a compelling reason to allow negotiations between more than two parties so suppose we allow compromises involving D conditions. Right, so the question we may want to ask is what is the smallest value of D that actually guarantees success in the hybrid? 
So we can prove a trivial upper bound, which is two to the power d minus one, which is roughly, you can't, right? You don't need more collisions and the number of vertices of the hypercube, which isn't very powerful. And then we have some optimistic results. So in three dimensions, actually kind of compromi compromises that involve three collisions is, is sufficient. For d equals four, uh, the answer is that it's enough to, to have five bay negotiations. But then four, and we sort of hope that this quantity would grow slowly and ideally sublinearly with d. But again, something that the week has shown is that this conjecture was unfounded. And in fact, there's, a, there's an exponential lower bound. So compared to continuous spaces, hypercubes are hard, discrete spaces are hard. So you need compromises involving exponentially many conditions. Right, and this uh, sort of almost matching couple of So let me say a few words on the speed of convergence. So a sequence of T compromises may have as many as two to the power square root 10 transitions, right? So even if when convergence is guaranteed, even if you have powerful enough transitions, we may still need a lot of them, right? And that holds even for two compromises, right? And also finding compromise transitions is indeed part in the hypercube. So hypercube seems like the kind of space where it's hard to negotiate, right? And I think what's instructive here is the huge complexity difference between the hypercube and our but RD intuitively, if we have the dense proposal space where it's easy for agents to identify compromise positions, and hypercube is the one where each issue is either zero or one, and there are no intermediate points. Right? And having this more rigid structure makes arriving to a, a good outcome, to a good change of the status quo, very hard. Okay, so this is roughly my summary. And I think kind of the useful intuition one can gain from this paper is that, well, deliberation is hard, right? And it's especially hard if it's difficult to identify compromise positions, right? So continuous spaces are easier than discrete spaces, right? And this is exactly because in continuous spaces, you might be able to identify a small change from the status quo and therefore find broad support for it. Right? If you're not asking for anything too ambitious, it might be easier to build support around that issue. Right? So open questions, kind of technical open questions. So all the simple transitions that ensure convergence when proposal space is a subset of R. Right? So I'm not sure what simple would mean here. D compromises with large D is probably not it. Right? And kind of complementary question is how rich the space be for compromise transitions to succeed. Right? So we said dense, subset of RD is good, but maybe we can relax that further a little bit more, right? So another technical question is if there's an explicit sequence of compromises transitions in 2D that is exponentially long, it would be interesting to see an example, something we don't have at the moment. But kind of more broadly, I think this is a direction worth studying how automated agents working together with humans and navigating a complex space of proposals can help the society identify a beneficial change so that it doesn't stagnate, so that it's able to make progress. Okay, let me stop here and take questions. Thank you, Edith, for your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, so first, opening up the floor to uh, audience. Any questions from the audience? Feel free to un unmute yourself and ask away. I'll, I'll start with a uh, first question, Edith. So I, um, there was a lot of theory, which is uh, nice, but uh, I'm also interested in uh, learning more about how you think this will be applied uh, to some interesting uh, practical uh, questions, because surely there will be assumptions and you've talked a lot about them as well. Can you tell me about what you think are some of the most interesting assumptions that you would like to see this uh, deployed to? Uh, okay, so it's less about kind of deploying the specific algorithm, so we don't even have much kind of in the very specific algorithms to be deployed, right? So it's mostly trying to understand kind of at the theoretical level, what makes negotiation difficult and what makes negotiation easy, right? So I think one lesson that we can learn from this is that it's much, much easier to achieve convergence when agents are good at finding compromises, right? So if we want our automated agents to help us find compromises, to help us navigate political landscape, so we should endow them with capability of making kind of, of identifying you know, 
fine-grained compromises in the issue space, right? So understanding kind of what the issue space is, right? And what, what would constitute a reasonable compromise? How can you formulate it in a way that is acceptable to humans, right? So staying with the discrete setting of kind of voting yes or no on every proposal really makes life hard. Right, so what we need from our automated agents is to be, we need nuance. Mm -hmm. I think this is the insight, right? So I think kind of the usefulness of this line of work is more at the level of kind of understanding the big picture rather than deployable applications. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions from the audience? We've got people thanking you in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't seem like there are any more questions. So I'm thinking that means your talk was very clear, Edith. <laughs> Good job. Thanks Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Edith, again, for your, your great talk. And um, thank you, everyone, who attended the talk. And we'll be meeting again uh, next month for the next talk in the series. The, this talk was recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and it will be announced on the mailing list as well. So thank you, everyone, and see you next time. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.